Study session in order, and uh, I think our first, number one, good evening everyone. Thank you all for being here. See the, the our fire department is here in full force, so it's good to see you guys and gals, if there are any gals out there. Um, anyway, we have a presentation from, from the fire department tonight on two subjects, one the fire department CON and the second on fire station relocation. So Chief, I'll throw it to you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I have about five to six items that we'll be covering over one presentation. And uh, the concept behind this is how they uh, interweave with each other and work to support each other as we go through. And uh, with that, always start off with our uh, mission statement, our vision statement, and of course our department values. And uh, this is the one that we had created back in 2015 with our strategic plan. The items I'm looking to cover this evening are the uh, vitals of the department, uh, talk a little bit about the low acuity <coughs> pilot program, the Safer Grant Award, uh, the City of Casa Grande CON process, fire station replacement plan with the GEO bond, and then kind of next steps and timelines uh, to kind of bring everything together. And uh, Chief Keen and I will uh, be tag teaming as we go through the presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, this, is, uh, this presentation will allow us to show how these initiatives and opportunities will work together to provide a solution to the city as we move forward addressing our community needs and maintaining the quality of life in our community. Current vitals, what I'm kind of looking at here is this is a snapshot of the uh, fire department. Uh, we've had the opportunity back at the end of July, uh, Chief Keener, myself, or both of us and the uh, city manager had an opportunity to meet with you and talk about some discussion points. Uh, some of this you'll have already recognized. I'm just bringing it up kind of in the snapshot. Um, our uh, city property, primary property tax, there, we've been uh, no increase through 2019. And of course the sales tax, the city has maintained strong with the 2% uh, over that same period of time. And I'm looking back pretty much 2008 to 2019 as the area I'm, I'm looking at. Obviously in the parentheses to show everybody what the actual uh, tax is with the uh, county uh, piece of it. So. The uh, staffing per day, um, in 2008, we were with 16 firefighters on duty per day. That's with the four engine companies with a staffing of four on each truck uh, made up of the three platoon system. Uh, in current today, as of uh, 2019, we are sitting with 16 firefighters on duty per day. We have not had an increase or done anything to change our uh, deployment. Our firefighters per 1,000 population, back in 2008, we were sitting at 1.32 per 1,000 population in our community. In 2019, we are sitting at 0.98, uh, about a 26% reduction, and that's because our population has continued to increase um, out there. Uh, NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, recommends a 1.1 to a 1.5 per 1,000 population. Our annual calls for service in 2008, we were running 5,892 calls in that calendar year. In 2018, the full calendar year, the last one, is 9,427 calls that we ran during that calendar year, which is a 60% increase in our call load since 2008. <coughs> our average calls per day, uh, is uh, right at 16.14 uh, back in 2008 and in 2018 it's 25.89 per day. Again, equates to the same with the call load, 60% increase. Our ISO grading, which is the insurance service office, uh, we uh, in 2008 was a class four and the recommendation at that time was that we were an engine company down. And our last regrading, which was in 2018, we were able to reduce to a class three. However, we are still an engine company down. Uh, the reason we did do a decrease is that we had in invested in some data 
uh, the CAD system, the RMS system, our image trend, which is our EMS, um, RMS system, records management system. So there was a number of things that we had done in order to uh, help and improve that. Okay, so the, the class three is better than a class four? Is it yes, sir. Better, the lower than yes, lower than it ranges from a class <coughs> one to a class 10, class one being the best that you can be. Okay, thank you. Our average response time uh, in 2008 was at six minutes and in 2019 our response time is set at five minutes and 23 seconds. Uh, we did put in the citywide Opticon system uh, that we installed back in 2009-10 which is all the traffic signals that have those um, lights on it, picks up the sensors from our emitters <coughs> on the vehicles and then it, it, it goes from a safety on the traffic light to give us a green to go through and uh, basically that uh, reduced us down when we started that I think it was close to 45 to 50 seconds is what that major reduction was and uh, we're slowly uh, going back up on that. Uh, another uh, item to discuss on here is the uh, average unit hour uh, utilization for first out fire department units. Um, ours is sitting at a point two seven, and that's an average. I'll share with you if you like the individual for the stations. But the uh, unit hours, the way you figure that out is you would take 24 hours a day times 365 days. That gives you a total of 8,760 hours within that calendar year. And then you take the total calls that you're running divided by that 8,760 hours that gives you your unit hour utilization. And in the indicators, a 0.16 to 0.24 is considered an ideal uh, commitment where, that where you need to be, that you're able, to, your crews can maintain their training. Uh, they can do their physical, uh, 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 physical uh, training also, and they can uh, meet the response times. As you get busier, 0.25, there's what they call system stress. Your first two units are responding to your area, <coughs> to their main area, about 75% of the time. Then you hit the two point, or 0.26 to 0.29 is evaluation range that you're experiencing delays because there's so many calls going on. Other units are responding from different stations. And then you have a 0.3, which means basically it's not a sustainable system to be sitting in. When I uh, break it down from the individual stations, our average is 0.27. However, when you look in uh, 2018, station 501 was at a 0 0.38. Station 502 is at 0 0.33. Station 503 is a 0.17. And station 504 is a 0.16. When I look at it currently year to date um, in 2019 calendar, Station 501 remains at a 0.38, 502 is at a 0.32, Station 503 is a 0.19, and Station 504 is a 0.20. So that's where we're at currently on our unit, our utilization per each station. Obviously, um, we do understand that uh, the increase in staffing um, there's been a lack of revenue. There is a lot of revenue coming in to be able to, to bring up and put additional uh, resources on. So as I continue on, you'll see where we, we look for alternatives. We look for grant funding and see what we can do to help us out uh, to move in that direction. What I want to touch base next on was our low <coughs> acuity uh, program that we put in place for 90 days. I know we have a couple of new council members since we uh, did do that pilot program. This pilot program was done from three month period back in March, April, and May of 2015. Uh, what the department decided to do is that we would add two additional firefighters per shift to staff that low acuity and run a 90 day pilot and see what the data showed and how it came out. So that's what we did. Uh, low acuity uh, unit stands for basically it's a, a BLS or a basic life support type of unit with uh, two medically trained personnel on board and they would handle the, the lower acuity of the calls, not your severe ones like a cardiac arrest and, so, and uh, some of the others and I'll go through that in just a second here to explain the difference. 
the uh, the unit was able obviously to save uh, safer travels with responding code 2 uh, because they're going to a lower acuity doesn't mean they have to be going code 3 code 2 is normal traffic code 3 is emergency traffic uh, rescue 501 is what we had staffed and it picked up 20 percent of the call load during that three month period uh, from the all risk ALS uh, units which is our engine companies um, so they were available for the higher priority calls. The items we consider in that higher level of uh, care would be cardiac arrest, difficulty breathing, strokes, broken hips, legs, trauma patients involved in motor vehicle accidents, blunt trauma, uh, stabbings, shootings, machinery accidents, allergic reactions, etc. fall into the ALS category where they'd have to utilize the additional skills, the medications, the drugs, uh, the monitoring equipment that they carry. Station 501 during that three month period had 230 times uh, total concurrent calls in March, April, and May. And uh, what I mean by that is that they were um, on uh, 230 total calls and then 156 times they were on different uh, Times so, in other words, 230 times they ran together, and then the rescue unit could take care of it, and the engine could be freed up, or they ran 156 times separate calls uh, in Station One's area. Rescue 501 ended up transporting six times during this pilot program. Additional outcomes: Rescue 501's medic rode into the hospital 72 times, which allowed the engine to remain in service for the higher acuity ALS calls. One of the things we saw is there was a reduction in our diesel fuel um, from running the larger vehicle to running the smaller vehicle. During that period of time, we saved 860 gallons of diesel fuel um, versus the previous uh, period of time. Response times decreases both code two and code three. Our, our calls uh, went down because the rescue was uh, running code two and thus taken away and leaving the code three for the ALS engine companies to run. We had increased customer service. We had patient refusals for transport 83 times, which meant the system didn't have to get overloaded and have that transport piece of it. Uh, both engine 503 and 504 uh, were moving out of their first due areas less with this pilot program because they were able to stay up in the northern part of the city. Some additional outcomes, uh, our mutual aid partners uh, were being called less for coverage. Uh, in fact, the Rescue 504 covered four move ups in March, eight in April and eight in May, which that meant is they provided medical coverage immediately versus waiting up to 15 minutes to get our mutual aid partners in the city limits. Because you still have their travel time for their communities, whether it's Eloy or Gila River or Maricopa. And uh, we're very grateful for the relationships we have with these departments because uh, they do uh, respond into our city uh, numerous times. This last year, if I'm not mistaken, they came into the city around 160 times and we only left the city around 52 times during that calendar year. So you can see the dependency of the uh, resources we use in the mutual aid agreements. There's less need for uh, internal citywide move ups with five units. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the rescue unit was able to move up initially to cover for medical. When we get down to only one resource, we move <coughs> our resource to uh, Treckle and um, um, Cottonwood. And that's where we put our citywide unit until we get more resources back because that way it's in the center and it cuts down the response time to get anywhere we need to go north, south, east, west. Um, it also allowed for increased training time, uh, physical agility time, the projects that our uh, captains and engineers and firefighters work on, uh, pre-emergency pre-planning, that's what PEP stands for, area familiarization um, for both Engine 501 and, and LT 502, so they were able to increase with the low acuity unit being in service. <coughs> Rescue 501 obviously would have an easier time if there was any construction sites, roadway uh, detours, 
any kind of routing issues because it's smaller and easier to adapt and move quicker. There's a reduced perception of customers seeing a pumper on every EMS call. And then the fire department is seen as being physically or fiscally responsible. <coughs> Reliability the EMS system increases because of that additional unit that we have up in our city. And increased life expectancy of an engine could actually lengthen out instead of being the 12 years that we're pretty well wearing an engine out, we may be able to stretch it out as we put low acuity units or look in the future at, at a CON that allows the smaller units to run most of the calls. Thing, no matter. Um, obviously, the, uh, the low acuity <coughs> unit has been seen as a positive thing to try to get it up, both from the council standpoint. I know the last few years we've talked about the budget. Um, sessions and uh, you, you've asked for us to be able to bring it up obviously there's a revenue challenge that's there and we haven't been able to so that we we could not bring up the personnel I, I think the low acuity unit is uh, and I'm just kind of segueing in here to their next areas the low acuity unit is a great transition into a CON or a rescue unit because it's that step in between as we're continuing to move up the staircase also, I'll be touching base on the safer grant, and this uh, allows for low acuity to be staffed 24-7, and I'll go into that when I talk a little bit about the safer grant and the uh, letter that we've received there. So in um, September, last month, a couple weeks ago in uh, 2019, we received a letter, an <coughs> award letter, um, from the safer grant, which uh, which, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, which we had members of our department, I want to thank uh, Battalion Chief uh, LaFalse and uh, Assistant Chief Keene. They were ones that compiled the grant and able to submit it. It's a strenuous competition that's out there for personnel through the SAFER grant. And it's all funded through Department of Homeland Security. What happens is the grant, the grant is over a three year period of time. It's uh, the grant award that the feds, the feds would pay would be $1,715,986. They basically over that three year period cover two thirds of the cost of the additional firefighters. The grant we put in was for 10 firefighters for the department. The breakout of those positions were six firefighters for the low acuity unit, and then three firefighters for an additional rover per shift. And that would allow our <coughs> personnel to be able to take the earned benefit time that they receive through the city to be able to use it so I don't have some people losing it because currently we only allow two people off per day um, to utilize their benefits because we just don't have the coverage and the overtime uh, goes up through the roof. Um, when I talk earned benefits, you can be looking at the, we have our two systems, a PTO, UPTO, vacation sick, family sick, we have bereavement, um, we have personal day, all of those items I have to still cover and maintain uh, coverage within the city. And the last position for a firefighter was set for an internal promotion um, as we're moving forward with our EMS, takes a lot for us to concentrate on all the requirements, licenses, certifications, quality assurance programs, etc. that we need to have a manager in charge of that um, at EMSBC. <coughs> so this other firefighter position was a concept of being able to come up from the bottom when we do internal promotions up uh, to cover that position as an EMSBC. Uh, a couple of things I'll, I'll cover here is on um, our rovers. We have currently uh, two rovers on each shift with the department now. Uh, we have a total of five that are full-time in the field. We have one that's in an academy class right now, so it will give us the, the two finally per shift. Those rovers, each of them are roughly hours or 2,912 hours of coverage for each. Um, so when you add those together, uh, you, you obviously you come up with uh, I think it's around 17 or uh, 17 18,000 hours and somewhere in that I didn't write down the exact however 
over the years, we have been short, even though we have the rovers, we're still paying overtime out for additional hours to cover the things that we do in the department. The uh, concept behind the additional rover is to give us another three people at 2912, which will bring us over uh, uh, about 8,700 hours plus. And right now we're right around 9,000 hours of overtime that we're estimated this year in addition to what our rovers can cover. So those rovers would actually help us out so there'd be less uh, overtime in the future as we move forward. So we're very pleased, very happy about the grant award. Um, these guys worked uh, real hard and there was a lot of eyes that were on it uh, to reviewing it and that's quite a significant grant uh, for us to receive. Obviously that'll be uh, dependent as we move to steps in that, uh, dependent on the council's acceptance of a grant. The next item I'd like to touch base upon is the City of Casa Grande CON. And I'm not going to go back in a uh, lot of uh, details. I'm just going to kind of touch uh, on some of the points that are uh, positive, the benefits of a CON. Um, obviously, it allows the city to be in control of its destiny. Um, it provides the city with revenue to hire fire personnel to staff rescue ambulances. And obviously, with the grant that we have, that low acuity coming in gives us the build up going up for the three years, get the low acuity unit going, and then look at the CON again if the council gives us direction to apply for the CON. And then uh, we apply and move forward with that. The revenue that would come in from that then would continue to grow our services to provide um, that level. Continuity of patient care from home to hospice is improved. The fire service base EMS are strategically positioned to deliver critical response and effective patient care. Our feasibility study that we did conduct uh, through the J. Vincent Group recommended that we would have four dedicated ambulances in our city to handle the call load when we would start up. The EMS system uh, reliability increases with us um, having four dedicated units in, in our system. The single unit response on BLS calls, so we would just be sent in just like the low acuity would handle two person lower. Uh, that would be the same way uh, with the CON, you just would continue that process versus having one, you would have four units that would respond. It allows to keep the four person ALS engine company available for the critical life threatening calls, and I mentioned these earlier, what those are and what we look at, because when you get involved in any of these uh, particular calls uh, types, you're looking for multiple hands on. Um, everybody is at work, all for all personnel that's on that truck, they all have specific assignments and jobs that they need to handle in order to get everything done in a quick amount of time so it can be transported and patient can get to the hospital. So that's why we have the four person uh, units for ALS. <clears throat> uh, the CON continuing on reduced response times uh, within our community for our customers, increased customer service, and then we would have a reduced perception of obviously, as I mentioned earlier with the low acuity, of uh, seeing an engine on every EMS call. And again, I know there's redundancy, but both of them provide the same kind of benefit, increasing the life expectancy of an engine company out further out than the 12 years. Uh, low acuity unit obviously is a great transition into the CON and the rescue transports. <coughs> the safer grant does allow for the low acuity to be staffed 24-7. From a fire station uh, overview, um, we've talked about this also in uh, CIP meetings and at uh, budget meetings about looking for a solution. What can we do in order to get our station strategically planned? We came to the council a few years ago and asked for a software to be purchased, which was called Deccan, and it's an analytic software program that helps us with that. So we did uh, get the funding and 
move forward with that purchase. Um, what we're looking at is a global vision for long-range planning. So uh, when I get down to it, Chief uh, Keen will talk about the uh, actual how that all works because he's the expert with the software. But the goal is to look and provide in a plan for up to six fire stations and others as necessary to uh, due to growth. And then from that concept is backing out to five stations and then backing out to four stations, saying where these four would go. And then when you add the resource, you're adding the resources, none of the other resources are necessary to move. Everyone's in its fixed positions. So he'll talk about that in just a few. Um, Fire Station 501, just to give a quick overview, is uh, <clears throat> this station was built in 1953. Um, great price back then, $72,600. Um, so it is a 66 year old station. Obviously, brick and mortar is designed to get you out to the 50 year mark to, for a fire station, and this one has certainly done that. Uh, last time it was expanded was in 1981, uh, 38 years ago, and that's because when it was originally built, it was built as a volunteer uh, department, and then from a volunteer it went to a combination <coughs> with both uh, part-time and full-time. Um, as I mentioned, brick and mortar station. This one, we're obviously it'd be one of the stations we're looking in as we move forward that uh, we want to look at relocating and. Uh, uh, replacing. One of the things I know that I, I've heard and we've had some discussions on this too is what do we do with the old fire station that's there, Station 501. There's a few different things we looked at. We mentioned before about it is the welcoming as you come into the downtown area, the historic downtown area, whether it was bulldoze and create a new uh, welcome coming in um, with some kind of a uh, anchor tenant. It could be used as other cities around the state of Arizona. If you notice, if you go to any of the smaller towns, they've used the fire station and it's been recreated as a restaurant downtown and even a brewery downtown. So there's some options there. Another idea we threw out for potential consideration in the future is looking to work with the historical society, put the old three fire engines back in the bays move all the public safety displays down there, and then our fire prevention de department can move in an office space area and be able to do education with the kids and stuff down there or have school buses come in. Just a couple of different ideas to throw out about what can you do with the, the station if, if we move. Station 502. This station was built in 1995 for $274,000. It's 24 years old. It was built uh, uh, by way of wood studs and stucco on the outside, so it's not a brick and mortar uh, <coughs> long, uh, long term station for uh, length. It also is on the property that it's on, it's limited from expansion capability. We looked and it was in our CIP, we were looking at putting a bay on and then adding another four or another two bunk rooms on it. Just to do that was a million two, um, just to do an addition to it. And that was pretty pricey to put into that particular uh, station in, in price. And it still didn't take care of the needs of expanding the kitchen area or, or the day room uh, where our firefighters um, hang out, work on the computers and stuff. It's just a very tight space that's there. One of the things uh, fire sta uh, staff has had discussions, again, what do we do with the property like this uh, if we were to relocate? Um, this property where it's located uh, would be great for a business to be able to come in. Who knows if it's automotive, whatever the type, stereo, whatever kind, there's bays to work in and a, a place to conduct business. And then I know that corner lot is still open over there and so who knows on bundling and what a business may be looking for. But that's uh, for station 502. Interim station 503, we opened it in 2001 um, because of the call load and response times and we need to get uh, another unit up. It is an old Casa Grande Union High School classroom trailer uh, that was donated to the department back in 1991 or 1999 
and that uh, trailer is from this site, was I guess on this campus uh, prior to that. Um, so the, the classroom, when you figure it out, it's over 40 years old, again is a, a wood uh, classroom module unit. What would happen here is the airport uh, has expressed its interest in uh, for us to vacate that area so they could actually build hangars and put hangars on that property that's there um, to be able to deal with the uh, pilots that are on the waiting list to get a hangar. So um, not much with the classroom there, but they would give them an opportunity to be able to build and it had additional hangars for out at the airport. <coughs> I'm going to turn it over to Dave on the deck. And uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council. I appreciate you letting me talk about this. This is what I'd like to talk about, so this will work out. Um, I, want to I wanted to provide a little bit of historical perspective on fire departments in the past. Um, in the past, fire service leaders would use their intuition and experience to make decisions on where they were going to put fire stations. And sometimes also on where they were going to place apparatus. Um, as with any intuitive type decision, you're, you're relying on that person's knowledge and experience to make the right decision. And we all know that sometimes that doesn't happen. Wrong decisions are made. I, I come from a city where we built a fire station that was just absolutely in the wrong location. We ended up having to close it probably 10 years after it opened because it just didn't belong there. It made no sense. And there was a lot of strange reasons that it went in there. But, um, we're building fire stations that cost millions of dollars. So we got to make sure that we're not incorrect. We have to be right when we recommend to you guys where a fire station should go. Um, we purchased a computer program last year called Deccan with your guys' approval. Um, and it's a software that basically allows us to make critical decisions on the fire station locations using actual data instead of intuition. Um, the historical call data is pulled from CAD, the Computer Aided Dispatch, another program that you guys upgraded last year for police and fire department. Um, these two are they interface together, so we're able to pull the data out of our CAD system, and the res response times response times are the way that a lot of people measure fire departments' um, service and reliability and how well they're doing, how good a job they're doing. That's a that's a method of looking at fire departments is how well they do on their response times. The better the response times that you have, usually equates to having more manpower, more apparatus, and typically more manpower, that means more funding, so you have more money being committed to the fire department. The Deccan program takes all the CAD data and evaluates it and then makes recommendations on where fire stations should go. And it does that um, by strategically picking the best locations. It's, it's intertwined also with a system, uh, another program called ESRI, which is a GIS mapping layer. And that's the system that the city already uses. We use in GIS for like the hydrants and the road maps and traffic signals. And there's a lot of different layers that the city has of mapping. Uh, next slide. The next map is, uh, it's a little confusing, but if you take a look at it, you can see the current fire station locations on there. You've got the uh, 503s uh, kind of in the middle, up there under the T. Um, you've got 504s is kind of under the L up in the north part of the city. And then you've got 501s and 502s down in the south end of the city. What this map is showing you, and, and I get it, it's a little bit technical, because it takes GIS, it takes road conditions, it takes road configurations, traffic engineering, a lot of different factors. and works it all together and basically comes up with a map. And, and once I tell you, I mean, you can see by looking at the map, it should be self-explanatory what we're showing here is that the grids or the little squares that are green are places that our fire engines can currently get to in less than five minutes. The yellow ones are from five to seven and the red ones are anything over seven minutes. Um, How about the gray ones? Okay, what's the checkbox? I was just about to say that. <laughs> so the boxes that have the grid marks or the diagonal lines on them, 
Okay. Those are areas that are considered no access. There's no road or there's no, oh. there's no uh, manner or way for us to get in there. And keep in mind, it only recognizes known actual asphalt roads that are by the city. It won't, it doesn't recognize dirt roads because we don't typically go down dirt roads. Now, so there's a building fire over here on, on Main Street. That's where everybody's headed to. Um, Convenient timing. Yeah, so uh, there are times when we have to go out into the desert, and obviously our guys, if they have to go out into the desert, they go out into the desert. They either walk out there or they use the dirt road, but this program only uses the asphalt roads for typical responses and stuff. So to, to really kind of break this down and make it simple, what we're attempting to do is place our fire stations so that we get the most grids green. We want to be under five minutes and it's it's really simple without getting too technical that's that's the bottom line is we want as many green boxes on there as we can get and if we have some yellow that's okay what we want to do is reduce the number of red boxes now you guys know the city way better than i do but if you look way out west out there there's red boxes that will never be able to get disappeared i mean we just we can't you don't put a fire station out by francisco grande to, to mm -hmm. handle the one or two or three calls that we have out there That's in here. <coughs> yes, sir. Chief, do you have a breakdown of like population density, like that are the or even number of calls based? Calls. I, I don't have that, but yeah. I, I have other but stuff. But you know, like is ninety percent of the population in the? Yeah, and I'm going to mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. I didn't oh, include yeah. it in here, but I mean, good. basically the Florence yeah. corridor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can see the Florence corridor by looking at the map, and on the next slide, if you go to the next slide, Chief. If you look at the next slide, there's a street overlay on there, and it should be really obvious. You guys, again, you guys know the city better than I do. That Florence corridor, 70% of our calls are on the Florence corridor, and that's why 501s and 502s are very busy, uh, and 503s and 504s. We still have to protect the houses. We still have to protect the citizens in the north end of the city, but 70% of our calls are down here in this Florence corridor, and I, and I call the Florence corridor basically down to Jimmy Kerr, up to Cottonwood. I mean, that's where 70% of our calls are. Um, but the other 30% of the calls, they're not any less important or any more less serious. Or when somebody's house is burning up, up in the north, it's just as important as the one on Florence. So we still have to protect those. And that's kind of the goal of the fire department is to strategically place apparatus and people so you can provide the best response times. So what Deccan does, that's what Deccan does. It, it tells us, and we're able to punch in and say, we'd like to see what the city would look like with six fire stations. We'd like to see what it would look like with seven fire stations. And then what we do is we pull or close stations down in that. And the, the program is uh, intuitive, in fact, that if I say, okay, close this station, it changes the time. So we can say, I want to see what the city should look like with four stations. I want to see what it looks like with five. I want to see what it looks like with six. So that 10 years from now, we don't look back at the city and go, oh man, we built that station in the wrong spot. So we have a station that we can't move. We have, we have station 504 that's in a spot. That station can't move. Whether it's the right location or the wrong location, we can't move it. It's a new station. But the other three stations don't meet a lot of the health and safety codes. They don't meet a lot of OSHA requirements. They don't meet hardly any of the NFPA requirements. And the, the stations are just old and run down. And they're it's time that they're replaced. I know all of you care deeply about firefighter safety and our conditions that our firefighters and I know that because I've talked to all you guys and you guys have all talked to me about it. So that's kind of why we're coming to you with this because we want to make sure we tell you the right spots or make the right recommendations on where you're going to spend this money to build fire stations. When we look at fire stations and um, these things, the big, the big thing that we're looking at is the value or the time is the travel time. It's from when we're dispatched and to when we go in route and to when we go on scene. So we're, we're basically evaluating those times very seriously. And we kind of already talked about it, but I'll, I'll give you an example of the program. Another thing with Deckard, one, one of the examples is it's, it's a computer program. So we still have to look at it and pay it. Just because it says, I'll give you an example. If, if, if Deckard said, Place five, 501s really should be at the southeast corner of Cottonwood and Pinnell. Could we do that? Of course we couldn't do that. They just built a brand new jack-in-the-box there. We couldn't put a fire station there because 
They just put a brand new restaurant there. So we have to we have to guide it or look at it and make sure that it's selecting the correct locations. And that's obviously not something we do alone. We have to do that in collaboration with Mr. Tice and planning a building because it may say, hey, there's a great space for a building right here. Well, that that's land that's owned by the state. And that's not where we're going to be able to put a fire station. So there's a lot of work and time and energy that goes into it. But I just, the reason we're trying to tell you this, all this stuff is it's kind of all a big system. This stuff all fits together. It's all intertwined together. And that when we make recommendations to you, we're basing it, we're not basing it on our intuition and experience. We're basing it on scientific data coupled with our experience. I think you're getting a, uh, a good recommendation in terms of those standards. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about it. The, our city, we always have to take into account our geography versus our call load. Um, we typically have to rely more heavily on our call load because if we relied on geography, you know, we'd have to come in here and tell you we need 10 stations to cover this whole geography. Well, that doesn't make sense. We don't have the money for that, so we would never do that. Um, that's basically Deccan in a nutshell. We just kind of wanted to give you a brief over of, overview of it and let you guys see it. And we'll probably sit down and meet with you again to kind of show you and let you look at Deccan because this is not a decision that's going to be made today or, or anytime soon. Um, but we'll have to look at it and see where it's saying those stations are. And, um, and obviously with Mr. Tice to see if it's zoned correctly and all that different type of stuff. So that's it for Deccan. And uh, just to tie in with uh, what Dave was saying, uh, some of the benefits for relocating the, the three stations is to provide a five minute or less response to our community. With playing with the system and uh, moving the stations and having it tell us where it goes, we're currently like at a five minute, 23 second. And there's potentials that you can drop it down below there you know, uh, lesser times. It just depends on where the station goes and then it recalculates and tells you. You know, I don't want to come in and tell you we're going to drop it to 4.30 or what have you. It depends on where they actually end up going and how much it reduces down. Um, but it does give us a better coverage of what we're looking for and, and we're looking at where our population is at. Uh, we're able to add resources in the future as needed. As uh, Chief had indicated, we can go up with additional um, the stations, by replacing them, we're looking newer, modern, energy efficient <coughs> fire stations uh, built to last 50 plus years and I will use station 501 as that proof that that can happen. Um, by doing uh, the three stations, we look at replacing a 66 year old, an 18 year old interim that is actually 40 plus years old, uh, replace a 24 year old station that not built for the long term. And also, by looking at this, it does defer building Station 504 out. I can't tell you how long. I don't have a crystal ball. Population, what's happening, I would want to take a guess to say X years. It's just it will defer building that out. Can I add on to that, Chief? Yes, you may. I just want to say one more thing about that. Just, I mean, you guys all understand Deccan now, and you see what... And in the whole scheme of things, when we say that the average response time would drop, you know, 30 seconds or 45 seconds or drop a minute. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's huge. Yeah, that when you're talking about uh, 9,000 <laughs> calls to drop the average by 45 seconds or a minute. I mean, try to hold your breath right now. Stop breathing right now. <laughs> try to hold your breath for 45 right. seconds. You can't, it's very difficult to do so. Uh, by knocking 45 cent seconds off a response time, that is huge. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we rely on. We rely on. Um, <clears throat> Response times are critical to us for fires. It's critical to us for emergencies. Um, and I, I just, I, that, that knocking 45 seconds or a minute off of average response time for that many calls is a huge thing. Inhalation of smoke is one of the most deadly things, isn't it? Starts. Absolutely, yes, sir. <clears throat> and, and there's a lot of studies and stuff you can get you look there, at. And the, the less uh, those people would be in jeopardy if you could get them out of there. That's okay. correct. And if you look at the studies and stuff, uh, you know, our, our response time on fires, NFPA wants us to be our first arriving unit to be there within four minutes. And there's reasons that they say four minutes. The four minute uh, guideline is kind of a, 
that's a, a thing where they say if you get there within four minutes, you might be able to or possibly have the best chance of confining it to the room of origin or the area of origin. Once you go past four, five, six, seven, eight minutes, now it's spreading to other rooms, the attic, all over the house. And I, we've, you guys have seen examples of that here in Casa Grande a number of times. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it does take us a long time to get to calls. So Chief, you said that our response time now is five minutes, 23 seconds. So what's the overall average across the country? There's no overall average okay. across the country because all the fire departments across the country are so diverse and different. Okay. Um, you know, okay. where I, my old place that I came from, we had 24 stations. And our response time was, was not five minutes and 23 seconds. Okay. It was higher than that. So um, it, it's completely dependent. This city is a little bit unusual in that it's suburban, urban, and it's, you know, if you're right here, you're in the city. So. Um, it changes greatly depending on where you are. Some places in Pennsylvania and <coughs> North Carolina, there's a lot of volunteer fire departments. It may be, you know, they're just going out to squirt water on the house that, that burned down already. Okay. Back at the beginning in 501, Gene Lehman and his partner, that was mm -hmm. their hotel also, as well as a volunteer fire department. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, oh, we're not done yet. I'm still going, sir. <laughs> yeah. Get it going, Chief. I just let it go for a Yeah, don't hold your breath. <laughs> Although we have highly trained personnel that's in this room. Exactly. The, the next item that I kind of touch about with the relocation of stations is looking how do we fund that kind of a project. And uh, our proposal is to consideration on looking at a geo bond uh, for the funding mechanism for that. Um, what that geo bond would look at would be to be able to purchase three parcels of land. And we're not telling you where those parcels of land are at because we want to wait until later on, um, <laughs> keep our costs down. Uh, you want to build three brick and mortar fire stations so that you know they're going to be good for 50 years and where we're putting them is the correct places to build them. And we also, when we move out of the airport, we need to be looking at what are we going to do for our training center. So this does uh, provide us over a three to five year period of time to be able to phase in a new training center in the industrial park uh, where we can uh, conduct uh, live fire training at. Uh, estimated bond we're looking at is a $20 million bond. Obviously, it would have to be through a special bond election in which uh, city manager and yourself would determine what's appropriate uh, and when to do that. The uh, current um, pricing for fire stations right now, depending upon what you're looking at, as of today, it could be anywhere from $350 a square to $500 a square. It depends on what kind of um, land preparation, what do you need to do, drainage areas, leveling it off, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. whether you've got to uh, have additional roadways come in, how far are utilities are away, uh, what's your FF and E for it. So uh, that's where that square ranges uh, would, would play into um, for this. Yes, sir. What, what was the cost on Station 4? Because I, I saw that 20 million, I thought that was a little light. Right. Yeah. Um, station uh, 4 was 3.5 huh? million okay. when we built that uh, with the land and the roadway improvements, everything in that one. Okay, thank you. It's gone up by about 40 percent since then though. Mm -hmm. it, all, it all depends on, yes, there, some of the areas are much higher. What was? Construction costs. Oh, materials. construction. Yeah, that's what uh, our architect right now, that as of today, this is the, the range we're looking at. Um, for a particular station to be built. Is do you, you know the dollar, like how many square feet are we looking at? So the dollar amount? Um, I it? do not have that with me to Five provide. I don't want to guess at what our last station was. We yeah. were talking about that tonight before dinner and uh, they were trying to locate the square footage for me. So you came up with the 20 million based on what, Chief? Based on uh, three fire stations at about uh, four mil to four and a half mil each depending upon what the oh, okay. but that's just a guesstimate what you're and saying then, is yeah and that's just a my uh, rough estimate which i felt good hearing what the dollars were because it actually lowers it for me and then the uh the balance of that for the training center 
And so when we do these bonds in that, does that, will that also include equipment and to outfit the, it doesn't, does it? No, our, what you do is your FF and E. Right. So whatever you have to put in there, tables, chairs, beds, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. ovens, refrigerators, all that in a station. As far as apparatus equipment, we already have that that right. moves into those stations. But as so. far as, uh, yeah, like furniture, furnishing. Is that included in that? that? Yes, that's included in there. Okay. Your FF and E is built into your square footage uh, pricing. So basically what we're looking at is we've been looking at a solution trying to bring everything in and show how it all can help feed and uh, progress forward for the department uh, to provide coverage within our community to enhance the, the service, um, work on our response times, etc. So we've touched base on how all these are linked together. The SAFER grant obviously is a huge impetus for us with a million seven to come in over a three year period to be able to provide the 10 additional firefighters gives us the six for the low acuity unit so uh, we could get that uh, up and running and then the same way with the uh, the additional rover and then from the EMS side we've touched a little bit about the low acuity unit the value of that pilot program uh, the CON the, the value that that would bring to our community would control our destiny and continuing to provide additional um, response units in the city. The EMS oversight that we would need uh, with the battalion chief's position in there for all of our EMS. I mean, it's very getting very, very complicated on everything you have to do. And then the fire station geo bond for the location of those stations when they're built. They're built to be able to house those additional personnel and those units that will be going in very similar to what station 504 is that is outfitted so you can add additional uh, resources. Something that uh, I wanted to tie in is back in 2015, uh, we did do a department strategic plan that we had uh, discussed. And uh, there was, uh, we did some key result uh, areas and we talked about enhancing our operational capacities and we looked at uh, a couple of items with standards of coverage, which we uh, created that. Maintaining our ISO rating of a four well, we've increased it to a, a three. We bettered that one off. And then we wanted to establish two-year hiring lists for firefighters and create a list to be able to do that. We've done that for since 2015. We've had that going. And our process that we do on the hiring list is outstanding because we have very, very good personnel that come through that process that we offer positions to. We also looked at another key result area was alternative funding. What kind of funding can the department be looking at to help because we know the revenue is tight in the, in the city? We looked at fire recovery and uh, we brought that up and it wasn't really a, a popular thing and it wasn't uh, made for us to move forward with. We talked about the CON, which we've been uh, talking about, did the feasibility study on. We're looking at the wildland opportunity, which we do participate in the wildland. It does bring in some revenue for us in that area. Look at grants. We've done very, very well in grants. Um, bonding was another item that we had listed down there as an alternative to be looking at. We did do our research into it, talked at an ELT level. We've brought it up for the budget process and CIP. And then the last uh, key result area we looked at in our strategic plan was data and, and uh, what can we do with uh, analysis and uh, like I mentioned earlier, we did our replacement of our new CAD, and we have a new record management system that comes with that CAD. Our image trend is our EMS record management system, and we got DEC in, in Atom, uh, which is the analytic piece of it um, that we've done. So the items we identified back in 2015 in the department strategic plan, every, you can see where everything has continued to move forward for us there. So what's the next step in the timelines? What we're looking at is um, next council meeting will be uh, an item on there for your consideration as far as accepting the grant from uh, the SAFER grant from Department of Homeland Security of that $1.7 million in change, almost 1.8. Then we'll be looking uh, in the future about academy classes. 
Um, what we're looking at is we want to put six firefighters in the first class and we want to put four firefighters in the second class is what our recommendation is going to be. We know that uh, in January and February we have a couple of classes coming up with academies which is Northwest Fire and Mesa Fire. They've both done a great job for us in the past. We would uh, utilize that. And then Northwest is looking at another one in July and Mesa may be looking at one in June. So we're just waiting to see uh, what may happen and, and split them out. The reason we wouldn't do all 10 at once is that would be two firefighters per shift. We would want to put them at our, obviously our two busiest stations for their probation period. Gives them time to learn and adapt and learn what the city's about. It's a lot of work for our captains and our firefighters and engineers that work with those uh, probationary firefighters because they give a lot of attention because we, we want them to see them succeed. Um, after probation and then when they can move over then we can move another four in and we're not overloading um, not being fair to the guys we're hiring and not being fair to our crews that are already out there uh, working so that's what we'd be looking at there the low acuity unit um, we would be able to start staffing that up full time after graduation which would be around in June and we would be able to get them on board right away because we've got the rescue unit to uh, Put the personnel in and start doing the low acuity. As far as the Casa Grande CON, uh, we would again ask for your consideration and approval on our application. Uh, the application process is what would be done through our consultants, JV uh, Vincent Group, and that would go through a process that we mentioned before. It would take at least six months to put an application together and to go back and forth with Q&A with the Department of Health Services and submit that uh, CON um, at that point in time. The additional rovers, uh, we would be able to, with the SAFER grant, be able to look at after the second uh, row, uh, second uh, dates for academy classes, we'd be looking at a November, December to get that third rover on and be able to start utilizing them for coverage for the earned benefits. Same time frame, November, we'd be able to get the EMSBC up and on board and start uh, having that as a major uh, focal point with all the requirements that are necessary for EMS. And then the fire station geo bond, we would uh, look at your consideration and approval at a council meeting. Uh, to move forward based on special elections date. Again, that would be between the city manager and yourselves. Um, and then let the voters would decide a special election. Um, Larry had mentioned about March 21st, 2020 as a potential. So uh, that's why I have up there. These are some uh, steps and uh, timelines. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Hey, Chief, I have a question for you. The the safer grant, that's a three year grant, and it terms, right? So it ends. Is there an uh, application process to continue that, or is it just a one? No, that is to get your uh, firefighters back up. It's They'll pay like a third, a third, uh, or we pay a third, a third, and then at the end we're paying two thirds, and they do vice versa two thirds, two thirds, and a third over that three year period. Then year four, it's up to us at that point. So then all 10 of those positions are on the city they'll be on full full on the city at that point in time can you resubmit the grant is that a only if i have frozen positions if we if we have uh, decided that economy and you have and we have downturn so then that's what you apply for the safer to try to get that back up this was looking at how can we move forward get that low acuity unit up move forward with the con process because the con process you when you move forward with that that provides the additional revenue then to sustain after that fourth year. And I don't know what our economy is going to look like in four, four years from now. It could be very positive and things moving in a great direction. I mean, it's doing great right now, going in a good direction. Yeah. Uh, no, but I don't have a crystal ball. Yeah, no, I just was just asking a question. I, I low acuity idea. I think it makes sense since majority of the calls that are, that, you know, that they, they go on are medical. Related, you know, medical related, so uh, it seems like a better use of our equipment. Uh, but mm -hmm. we're just trying to think how do we fund it long, mm -hmm. long range. That's all, <laughs> Mr. Powell. 
what <laughs> just to follow up on what the mayor was saying <clears throat> it'd be interesting to, to have you guys work out what uh, with with using four ambulances how much money that would save on gas per annum and how much it would save on replacement necessity per annum we, we uh, are right in the middle of an update with our decking okay. system and that's one of the things that we've added is uh, yes, our savings are we'll, we'll be able to evaluate that and we'll be able to actually come up with a good prediction on response times as well yeah. right. a couple quick would it be a challenge to hire the 10 qualified people do you guys get enough applicants every time you we currently have a uh, two-year hiring list and we've only gone down the first uh, 10 or 11 and been filling with retirements and that that we've had or if someone got picked up at a mesa tempe or a phoenix and then uh, speaking about the decking program i would like to see too the map was helpful with the red but what's the percentage of population that would be served by you know because you, you even said some of the red will never i mean they'll never get on red or even, but, the, or even the volume you know what I'm saying? Like if, if it's What's 80 the percent of the population is in the green yellow area, that yeah, will give a five close. minute response time, or mm -hmm. or what that would be helpful too. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I understand what you're potential. saying. Um, yeah, I, I I can do that, and it, I mean I, I can actually provide you. I mean I think that street map is pretty. I can actually provide you one of these. Probably pretty close. And uh, if it's a pink square, uh -huh. it means there was three or less calls there last okay. year. Okay. Okay. So that'll help with the other ones, the little kind of next blue up is 25 or less calls last year, and the other one's 300 plus calls. Okay. The darker color. Like so dark 300 blue. plus of the calls were in those darker squares. Well, I'll get you guys a copy of that. And I, from your Facebook page, I did a very simple math because that's all I'm good at. But it says like about 65% of your calls were medical. 70% right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's just from, like I said, just from your, your st quick stat on Facebook. But I'm a, I have been a proponent of the low acuity mm -hmm. unit for a long time, as you know, and I think that would be a great thing to save us money. But we got to figure out how we're going to do that with this, mm -hmm. with this grant and everything, how we can sustain that. Are you finding her yeah. posts uh, about the call loads informative on Facebook that she's been putting on there? Oh, I like that. Yeah. You guys have Very. a great Facebook page and it lets people know what you guys are. And I was kind of joking earlier, like right in the middle of your presentation, obviously, there's a big incident <coughs> happening. We didn't plan that, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> well, you had to pause for a fact, but thank you. And thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, so I'd be interested to hear more. You know, it's a good introduction here. One of the. One of the other things that uh, I can provide to the city managers, we did a few years ago, we did the population density, suburban, urban, and rural on each one of our squares around the city. And that's what we were basing on. One of the things we used when we were relocating or locating a new station is uh, what was all going to happen in those areas. So I can provide that to the city manager. How often do we get land donated for a fire station? <laughs> uh, if it's in the right place, we wouldn't take the land just during the development meetings when we used to have the all day Wednesday I knew that meetings, some of them we we have around seven parcels that have been designated in different areas but most of those are in the outlying if it surrounding sense, right? area yeah. for those future growth and they're all required minimum of three acres and I believe we had two that were potentially five okay so three acres okay yes thank you um, first of all thank you both for the presentation because you gave us a lot of information but I'm going to ask for a follow-up, not tonight, I don't expect you to know it, but I want to go back to the manpower piece, the current manpower, because you had talked about PTO and denial, you know, because you don't have enough coverage. I'm kind of interested in finding out the percentage that a PTO that has been denied because there wasn't anybody to fill a shift. I'm, I'm curious about that, um, and I don't know if you can provide that, but um, I think that that's important for us to know. And then you also mentioned 9,000 hours of overtime, and I'm curious to find out how, how that was covered, you know, under budget, uh, was it, you know, sometimes it's by grants, and I don't want it tonight, well, we, I'm, I'm yeah. curious how, how we're... We don't have any grants that are available for us to cover any overtime. Okay. Uh, we go through the city manager and the budgeting process, and we put all the hours in there for the Strictly. overtime okay. that, is cut, that is asked for. When I said that uh, people aren't always being able to get their PTO is because we only allow two off. Correct. And it's all done through a computer system um, that they will apply for time off 
first two that are in there get that. Anybody else put in for that, they get a rejection. So I don't know if I can pull that out or not. Okay. I have to check with the software. So obviously that's a concern to me for <clears throat> firefighters that are, are with it, us now. It does, it does happen. Right. I mean, I get calls all the time. Uh, sometimes the battalion chief will call me and say, hey, this guy's got such and such going on and it's an emergency and sometimes we have to grant it. But it, I mean, it's, I, I'd be willing to bet everybody can raise their hand and say it's happened to them before. So. Right, okay. It does happen. And then, um, you had mentioned something about the current stations and they're not up to code and OSHA issues and things like that. Do you feel, is that strictly because it's a fire station or do you think because the building itself would hinder um, a resale value if we were gonna go out and sell it? No, there, there's, a, there's very specific regulations and health and safety and OSHA requirements and NFPA requirements for fire stations. A good example right now, I, I know that you've been probably spoken to a lot about the second set of turnouts. Well, right now, 501s, when you get off the rig at the end of the shift, you hang your turnouts on the wall right there next to the fire engine. Well, that's a no-no now. Now, turnouts go in a room with a sealed door so that the fumes and the uh, basically Correct. all the chemicals that are being released from those coats aren't going all over the station. They're in that room and they're removed through a ventilation system. Like 504 the has that. But all right, so it's specific to fire, not just the building in general. Correct, yeah. Okay. If you go to 501s, though, go, you've been in 501s. Mm -hmm. If you go to 501s and 504s, yeah. there's a big difference. At 501s, all the pipes, the gas lines, the electrical <laughs> lines, everything's on the brick walls in the station. Mm -hmm. There's stuff that's been abandoned, stuff that's not used anymore. You go to 504s, it's built into the walls. Mm -hmm. The alarm right. systems are built right. into the station. It's designed as a fire station. They didn't think about those things in 1953 when they were building that fire station. I love the building. It's just not suited to be right. a fire station anymore. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate you on the safer grant. I mean, that's that's really exciting. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, um, you know, we, we all really supported and we were excited to see the results of the low acuity. And, of course, it was unfortunate that we weren't able to fund it to continue. But it's something that comes up every year in the budget season, and we all talk about it, and we know, you know what, what a great program is. So I really commend you for putting that grant together, and obviously a very successful grant. So thank you very much. I'm really, really excited about that. Um, but again, how are we going to fund it after those three years? Um, you know, critical. I know what, the, you know, as the mayor indicated. So, you know, I think, you know, it's important for us to, because the consultant gave us revenue um, estimates so I think it's going to be important to kind of visit those again I would think that if we accept this grant before we hire those 10 firefighters we can look at look at that right can't we look at it and just kind of get an idea of the revenue and how it can fund it over those three years and whatever um, you know how it can apply to you know at, or after the three years yeah, there's, more cost. there's cost right. in there you, you mentioned 800 gallons of diesel fuel well that's a cost and it's a right. cost it savings costs, yeah. so what is that cost savings you know I mean? yeah so there's savings there's savings in the whole package the, sure. the rovers right. the, the rovers are going to provide savings as well yeah so i right. think it's just going to be important for us to right. just kind of refresh it yeah. Then yeah that's great yeah. right uh, but yeah, no, and of Sorry. course the CON, you know, there's been so much discussion and we're, you know, I know I'm excited about moving forward on that. Um, as far as the, the, the question I have um, is, when, if you hire those 10 firefighters, do you kind of, um, do, do those new ones go straight to the low acuity and so you kind of mix it? Absolutely okay. not. My, my intent, and that's one of the reasons we've talked about hiring six and four. Mm -hmm. um, our fire engines, when we get a I don't want to point to one of the new guys, but there's new guys out there. So. <laughs> People on TV. I don't put that new guy with another new guy sitting right. in the back of the fire. Okay. That new guy goes with an experienced, okay. seasoned veteran in the back. Right. That and that's the reason why I can't. We can't hire ten people all at the same time because I don't have the. Right. I don't have the seats to put them in. To so train them and everything. That's why when okay. we put six and six, okay. because we typically put. Uh, guys at 501s and 502s, and then we flip flop them because 502s has a ladder truck, so they get okay. the busy stuff, and then eventually they rotate out to 503s so that mm -hmm. they learn how to use the brush truck and the ladder tender that's there, and they go to 504s to learn how to work the utility mm -hmm. and get some hazmat from the right. They don't do that till the very end of their probation period. Okay. Until we decide if we're going to keep them. Okay. We don't want to waste that time. And, and the, the question you had about uh, going on low acuity. That'll be up to the captain at that fire okay. station. They'll have that personnel, they man, and are responsible for the management of those personnel. 
and that's an opportunity for them to rotate off of an engine onto the to the low acuity unit and vice versa. And then it also helps on the, the skills level. Okay. And then um, finally, to, you know, I know that strategic plan was done in 2015, but I do want to thank you for just keeping on top of it. I mean, it, it's a vision and I really appreciate you, you know, just re revisiting it and see where we are and how we can move forward and seeing where the city is going to go. Because we, we have a lot going on, um, you know, with businesses coming in, with housing. So I really appreciate it. I know sometimes it feels as though we're not listening. I mean, many of you that are here that don't normally come to the meetings, it might seem as though we're not listening, but you know, it is important that, you know, the chief continues to update us on the vision and how we're going to move forward 10 years from now. So we, we do listen and it, it's just a matter of, you know, how can, how can we fund this? What can we do? But, um, but I just, I just really appreciate that. I know that exercise, you know, always seems like it's a pain, but, but, but it's important. And I know chief that you continue, both of you continue to keep on that and, and update us. So, um, I thank you for that, and I and I do appreciate you know the um, some of the uh, the firefighters here tonight. I mean I you know and we we like seeing you here. Please come anytime, but it's important for for people to see you know what we're doing and some of the issues that we face, making some of the decisions on policy and everything else. So Mary so anyways, Mary. thank you. Uh, just a couple <laughs> quick questions. Is is uh, it sounds like the CON is going to go forward and pretty much is a very realistic it's going to happen well that's hasn't been voted on yet well, that's your I understand decision. there's there was so much conversation on it and that and i'm you know i'm really in favor of that and really want to see that go through the other thing is i really like the idea of that placement of these uh, fire stations are data driven and need driven and not that oh well let's we need something east west south north mm -hmm. and that i like the idea that it's data driven I'd like to know a little bit more about the density in the red areas uh, because of that's the potential that there could be. And finally is, so we hear brick and mortar and we hear that and just what's the advantages? I know that, you know, personally I'd like to be brick and mortar but there's the expense in that. When building a fire station, is that really very beneficial to have, quote, a brick and mortar station? You, you look at it for longevity, and that okay. is one way of doing longevity is okay. through the brick and mortar versus two by four construction. Uh, I mean, we we live in there twenty four seven. Okay, okay. Just kind of, I I saw okay. that and I kind of wondered about it as far as that. Yeah, can I go? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> we have uh, over a hundred square miles in our corporate limits, and when you talk about trying to distribute and know where things. When Lucid and uh, Atessa come in, there's going to be a huge amount of development out in that sector. And one of the things we're doing our general plan right now, and, and Paul knows we go outside our corporate limits with our plan, uh, but the uh, trying to work with developers to, to build the fire stations in their areas for us uh, would, would be a really good plan. I mean, they've even talked about maybe in some of them to have their own fire department if it's that much removed. But uh, I think if we, can, if we can get some money from the developers uh, into the uh, construction business on our, at least on the fire departments, because if you guys have to keep building these things, it's, it's going to get expensive. Even GO bonds are going to get old. But uh, I think that at least that's something that, that can be discussed and hopefully we could achieve. That, that's been a really successful model in, in places. Orange County, California is a perfect example. As they were building tracks, they were having mm -hmm. the developers assist with that. I don't think we have quite the same situation here. Right. But uh, when, when you are building stuff, you do want to look at, at that. And, okay. and that's the, the, when you say you guys, you guys are the ones that are going to be paying to build the fire stations. <laughs> it's all of us, yeah, we all get paid. That's what you get for, so. <laughs> Bob? Yeah, uh, a comment and then a couple of questions. Um, 
first of all, thank you for all the information. You guys have really done your homework. I'm a thumbs up on all of this. I mean, it's just a question of when we can do it. Um, I have experience with this type of a grant in the police department, and my, my uh, somewhat biased opinion is we're almost foolish to not take advantage uh, of that. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, my, my other question is on the low acuity unit. Um, this is a question first, but are we, are we missing a component in dispatch? It seems to me like it's going to be a much higher level of triage at the dispatch level to get to the point that we're uh, confident in sending out a, a BLS unit alone. And are we at that point with dispatch or do we need to look at uh, resources there as well? Well, first off, we did implement this past year, and all of our dis dispatchers are, are certified now through a program for uh, priority dispatching, and they do have certain questions that are asked on different calls to determine what level that is to respond. So we did do that, and every dispatcher has been through that program, and the new dispatchers, as they come out of training, will go through that program also. Okay. Thank you. The, the other thing that kind of jumped out at me was the assessment of calls for service over the last 10 years. Um, it, it went up by 60%. And my question is, is there, is there other mitigating factors other than population? Because it seems like we outpaced our population times two uh, in, in that figure. Our population went up about 30%. Our calls for service went up about 60 um, one of the things we got to be looking at now, and I fall into this category, is the baby boomers. And there's going to be a lot of us hitting that area in which is going to increase on our medical call load. So that's even, we're, we're going to see it exponentially go up. <laughs> well, I'm I, I part mean, of that. I resemble that comment. So I, I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not unusual for call loads to increase 3 or 4% a year. That's typically what they do increase now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if, if I can just, uh, uh, again, thank the council for your patience tonight. I know there's a lot of items that were bundled into these study sessions this evening. There's some policy decisions that you're going to be considering here very quickly, and we did not want to ask you to consider those individually without more of a global vision of what Good is idea. transpiring. And so that was why we covered so much tonight. There is one point that I want to uh, uh, make a correction, perhaps, uh, because I see Mr. McGuire perhaps posting on social media, and I want to make sure that it's accurate. The, uh, when, when we talk about the GO bond, it's unlikely that we would be able to go to our voters before 2021 not March 21st, 2020, that's only six months away. Mm -hmm. They've already called that election. That it's, we're, we're out to 2021 at Gloria. the earliest. And so ultimately, <laughs> I just want to make sure that's clear for, for Mr. McGuire <laughs> so that we don't put our community on tilt. Um, but I also, uh, and, and, to, and to make sure that the council is aware of that, but that would likely be a policy decision that ultimately is going to come after all of, a couple of these other decisions that the mayor and council is going to be making. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that Thanks, clarification. Lady. Any other comments and questions? Thank you both for you. the presentation mm -hmm. tonight. And thanks to everybody else for, for coming also in support of that. So we'll stand adjourned. It's now five, five after. We'll start at 7.15. 10 minutes, 7.15. That long? Okay.